A little over a year ago, I went to the doctor for a couple times, thinking that I was going for something as simple as the common cold. Um, but it turned out my doctor found a large mass on my lung. I, I went home that day to wait on the results of more tests than my biopsy, and I, I just kind of laid down and I wasn't sure how I was ever gonna get back up. I was scared for me, for my kids, for my parents. They had just lost a, another daughter a few years before from the same disease. The best way that I could probably describe it is it literally felt like the devil was ripping away at my heart and my, and my mind. Um, and it didn't matter. I just, I felt lost and it didn't matter how many people were around me. I still felt so alone. I allowed myself to feel that way for a few days. And uh, every time I looked at Bill or our youngest two kids, um, I just saw the sadness and the fear in their face. And um, it was funny because my youngest or my oldest son Zach, who you all know is the handsome media guy, <laughs> he came in and he was always so positive and he always had a smile on his face. And I had grown up in church and I, I, I knew just from seeing him and from knowing what I knew, we needed to find as a family what what Zach had already found. So um, that next Sunday, we went to Center Branch. Um, even though I was ultimately diagnosed with stage three lung cancer, after coming to church, I could <clears throat> almost right away feel the difference that it was making in our lives. Um, for example, the first specialist we went to, he was very doom and gloom and he gave me a prognosis that was very dark and seemed really hopeless. Um, and as soon as we left there that day, I called Morgantown to get a second opinion. I just wasn't ready accept, to accept what that first specialist told us. I, I knew that God had more in store for me. And um, when I called Morgantown, they told me that um, it was not likely that they could get me in as, as quickly as I needed them to get me in with the type of disease that, that I was diagnosed with, but, you know, um, that they would call me if they happened to have an opening, but um, I, I, I still, I, I kept my hope highs, so the very next day, Morgantown called me back, and they said that, um, there was a doctor there that was willing to, to fit me into her schedule and to get me in the very next day and um, to be there the next morning, bright and early. And, um, and that's what we did. And um, the very first time I met her, Dr. Claudney, um, she had just moved here actually that same month um, from Las Vegas. And um, she said to me, I don't know why UHC told you the things that they did, but I'm here to tell you that I'm not just here to treat you, that we're here to heal you, and that I'm gonna do everything I can medically, and then we're gonna pray. And then the second specialist, it was my surgeon, his name was Dr. Abbas, and um, his words to me the very first time I met him was, um, keep your spirits high and keep your faith very strong. And I knew right then when I heard those words from those two doctors that God had intervened and he had put those two wonderful, God-believing doctors in my life for a reason. I'm so happy that I found the Lord again and I'm so grateful for his healings and his blessings that he pours all over our family daily. Um, I'm also very thankful for this church. Everyone here is so kind and, and so welcoming. Um, and the pastors are great. Anytime that I've ever needed them for prayer or whatever, um, it could be in the middle of the day, in the middle of the week. Um, 
probably at their busiest times and they've, they've still invited me in and, and um, prayed over me. And um, just, I, I felt the same love and peace and, and their faith just like I did in my own, in my own son. And um, I'm so thankful to them for their, their love and their kindness and for helping to, me to find my faith and uh, for helping me grow in my relationship with God. In August, it'll be a year that I've been cancer free. And um, I thought for a while that I'd wait to do my testimony until after the one year mark. I thought that was important for some reason. Um, but I realized that I don't need a milestone to mark what God has done for me, um, how he's healed me. I mean, it's already done. Um, I should be telling people now. I should have been telling people all along. Um, and there will never ever be a day that um, I won't praise Jesus' name for what he's, for all that he's done for me. What is that awesome church? He's got our healer. Keep sickness and disease far from our midst, amen? He's God, our, God, I am the God who heals you. So um, God is good. Man, I'm so, so thankful. Um, I think we got a pad going there, Ryan. If you could mute those keys. Perfect, amen. Sometimes there's just random pads. It's come out of nowhere. Um, anyway, hey, we're so excited for you to be here with us. And uh, uh, Pastor Luke is actually in Tanzania right now. Uh, along with Pastor Will, they're, they're there and they got to, uh, I saw pictures this morning, um, we got the minister and uh, they, they helped dedicate a, a Bible training facility there in Tanzania that our church uh, got to be a part of in, in giving towards that. So that's so, so cool, isn't it? Yeah. There are, you know, people almost halfway across the world that are gonna be trained up to be ministers, trained up to, to learn how to pray for the sick, to learn how to preach the, the gospel, to how to you know, minister to people. And it, you know, we got to play a part in that, which is so cool. So you know, if you're one of those people that gave towards that, then um, we just thank you. And, and those people in Tanzania, I'm sure thank you. <laughs> so we're, we're so excited we got to do that. And also there's a group up from our church in Cambodia right now. Uh, I believe it's like 12 or so people are there. And uh, they're ministering to the people in Cambodia. I, I went on that trip last year, and it was just an awesome, awesome trip. Um, that one literally is halfway across the world. Trust me, I flew it. Uh, 48 hours of traveling later, we got there. Um, but man, it's just, uh, you know, the gospel works halfway across the world. Amen. Jesus is, is still the, the king halfway across the world. And it's super cool to see them, um, you know, doing, doing the work of God out there in Cambodia. And then last week, uh, we took a group of teenagers to Washington, D.C., and we got to uh, minister to people in D.C. And we got to um, kind of partner with Revival Ministries and Dr. Rodney Howard Brown. Um, and they um, are serious about seeing our nation shaken. And so we, we, we joined with them. And so we had, you know, teenagers out walking the streets in D.C. telling people, has anyone ever told you Jesus loves you? Has a great plan for your life? And I was so proud of them walking up to total strangers. It was, it was incredible. Um, and so uh, that was a great time. And, but maybe you're saying, hey, I'm not in Cambodia right now. I'm not in Tanzania. I didn't go to Washington, D.C., but I want to be involved in the work of the Lord and, and what's going on. And I would say um, get involved with that sur the surf week that's going to be going on next week. You know, the mission is the same mission whether you're on a trip or not. Amen. <laughs> so uh, people in North Fort West Virginia need Jesus just as bad as people in, in Cambodia or, or whatever. So uh, get involved um, with, with that. Like we said, you can sign up in the back afterwards and, and get involved in what the Lord's doing in our community. I mean, we're, we're really busy right now. There's, like we said, there's people's on mission trip, on missions trips. We're doing serve week, but you know, Jesus says that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are, are, are few. So we're making sure we're sending as many workers into the harvest field as, as we can. And so well, you can be one of those workers uh, next week with serve week. Uh, you know, when we, when we see our, our community and we say, man, our, our city's just not doing so great. It's just, it's just, it's going, it's going bad. It's going downhill. Our, our, our reply should not, or our response should not be to, to shake our heads and be like, man, the city's going, you know, 
It's, it's going downhill fast. Our response should be, man, the harvest is plentiful. Yeah. Amen. There are people that they're just waiting to meet Jesus is all they're doing. They're waiting for, for someone like you or me to come and tell them about the wonderful news of Jesus Christ in their life. So we get to be the hands and feet of Jesus next week. It's going to be very, very cool to be part of that. So we encourage you to do that. Um, but anyway, we are continuing in our series called Foundation this morning, and really the whole premise behind the series is talking about the Word of God being the foundation for our lives. And so the, you know, a few weeks ago, Pastor Luke started this series, and he started the series out talking about how sometimes people will blame the storms of life, uh, for, and they blame that as that's the reasons why my life is falling apart, why my family's falling apart at the seams, why, why nothing ever seems to work, and well... The storms of life came when I wasn't expecting them and they just started tearing everything apart. But really what Jesus teaches is that it's not the storms of life that cause our demise. It's the lack of foundation that causes the demise of our lives and things to fall apart. And, you know, Jesus says that, I believe it's in in Matthew 7. He says, says, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice as like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. So there's a category of people that when you build your life upon the rock of of the foundation of the word of God, we're not burying our head in the sand and saying that there's never problems in life, there's never storms of life, but When you're someone that you've built your life on the word of God, the storms of life can come all they want and they won't touch you. They won't affect you. Amen. That you, you know, the the winds can come, the rain can come, but if you've built your life upon the word of God, it won't matter at all. You can just watch as the storms roll in and they never affect you. And that's the way that God wants his children to live unaffected from the storms of life that we're strong, that we're strong Christians. So that that's, uh, you know, have you ever, Known someone that's unstable, just to be honest. Come on. You know, when you build your life on the word of God, you're a stable person. Maybe you've known someone that was unstable emotionally, mentally, whatever it may be. And it's always, it's always something, isn't it? You know, one day they're happy, they're full of joy. The next day they're depressed. You know, one day they're serving the Lord with zeal and with passion. The next day they're, they're falling away from God. Uh, you know, something came up, something happened. And so next thing you know, they're, they're no longer serving the Lord. You know, people that, that are unstable haven't built their lives on the solid rock of, of the word of, of Jesus, right? And so, you know, our, our, that's why it's so important. We'll, we'll stress this, you know, the, the series will continue beyond today. Just the importance of building your life upon the foundation of God's word. You know, I, I'm a t- uh, youth pastor, so I work with teenagers often and I can't tell you how many times I've heard, you know, stories like, well, you know, my parents got divorced and so I lived with my mom, then I lived with my dad, then I lived with my grandma, then I lived with my uncle, then I lived with my cousins. And it's just like, you know, there's zero stability in that family. You know, why is that? It's because no one in that family, you know, made a decision that as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. We will build our lives upon the foundation of God's word. And so, you know, it's, it's so important to have, you want to have a, a solid family, a stable family, a stable marriage. Build your life on the word of God. So that's kind of how we started this whole series out. And then the second week, Pastor Luke talked about how we build on the word of God, but we also build with the word of God. You know, so many times throughout scripture, the, the word of God is compared to food. And how many know that, you know, food gives you strength, Food gives you nourishment. Food helps you grow. For some of you in the wrong direction, I just kid, I kid. <laughs> food, food is good, gives you nourishment. You know, the Bible says that man cannot live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of, the, of God. So imagine if you, know, if you ate one meal a week. You, know, you eat brunch every Sunday and that's it. That's the only meal, you know, week after week, month after month, you have brunch on Sundays That's all. Do you think you'd be a very strong person? What do you think? 
No, you will not be a strong person. You'd be, you'd be weak. You'd be constantly starving. You'd probably be getting skinnier and skinnier and skinnier. And, you know, that's kind of an example we use that many times, maybe even Christians, people that, you know, we, we come to church on Sunday, we open our word for, you know, half an hour. We're in church for an hour and a half and we leave. And all week long, our, our Bible sits there collecting dust. And, and what happens? We're, we're, we can become malnourished. We become weak. We have no strength. We don't need more weak Christians, right? We don't need more weak Christians. What do, what do weak Christians do? They don't change the world. They fill seats on Sundays. But we need, we need strong Christians in this day and age, if ever, right? Yeah, absolutely. You, need, you know, the word of God says in Daniel eleven thirty two 32, it says, the people that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Them that know their God, they will be strong and they'll do exploits in his name. And that's, that's who we're called to be, is strong Christians. There's no time in today's age to be weak, to not know what the word of God says about, about you know, everything like, like health, not know what the word of God has to say about who we are. There's no time. There's no room for that. We have to be people that know our God, know the word of God, then we'll be strong and we'll do exploits in his name. It's so important. So we're building on the foundation of God's word. You know, in, Pastor Luke read this. He read in, in Psalms, in Psalm chapter one. It says, those who delight in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yield its fruit in season and whose leaves do not wither, whatever they do prosper. So when we become people that we, we love the word of God, we cherish the word of God. We delight in God's word. What does the Bible say about us? That we'll be like a tree planted beside streams of water. That in every season, one generation says, in every season, we will be bearing fruit. It doesn't matter if it's winter, it's spring, it's fall, it's summer. If we're someone that we, we meditate on God's word day and night, we delight ourselves in the word of God. It's not just a religious chore we have to do because, well, I'm a Christian. No, we delight in the word of God. When, you, when you're that kind of person, you'll bear fruit, good fruit in every area of your life. It says that your leaves will never wither. There's no dry season for people like this. There's no, there's no wet season. There's no dry season. You'll always ha have green, bright leaves. You'll never have withering leaves. And lastly, it says everything you do will prosper. That's the way God wants the children to live, amen? Everything we do shall prosper. Whatever you put your hand to, God comes alongside you and blesses the work of your hand. God, God makes a way where there seems to be no way. Delighting ourselves in, in the word of God. Do you know that we are to be people that have something to offer to the people around us? That, you know, Jesus told us to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, right? That's, that's our job, that we have, we have to be ready to, to speak when the moment comes, right? When, you know, next week it's serve day and we're out, you know, we're telling people about Jesus. We have to be people that have something to offer, maybe even in your everyday life, at work, that friend that, okay, the moment has come. I wanna speak into that person's life. But so many times if, if you know, the Bible says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Or out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when we get in a, a situation where we get to minister to someone, we get to speak into their lives. If there's no abundance, there's no overflow of God's word in our heart, then no, what can come out of our mouths? We got nothing to offer, right? That sometimes it ends up just being dry heaving, Pastor Luke said a couple weeks ago. It's just we're trying to say something nice, something encouraging, but there's no power in it. You know, the word of man offers nothing to anybody, but the word of God can set people free. Amen. We need to be people that have something to offer. So that's why we're really focusing on, on being people that don't just Know, know about the word, tolerate the word, but people that love the truth of God's word. And so today I wanna to talk about how truth will set you free. How truth can set you free from every lie from the enemy. That truth can drown out every lie from the enemy. Before we do that, let's go ahead and pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word. God, as we say almost every Sunday, I thank you that your word does not return void. That it never returns empty-handed. You send your word out, and it always accomplishes what you want it to accomplish. So this morning, as your word goes out, I thank you that it will accomplish all the things you want it to accomplish in each and every one of our lives. Every person in the sound of my voice, I believe you have something specific for them today. Holy Spirit, speak to us. We can forget 100% of the things that I say, but Holy Spirit, if you say something to us today, we won't forget it. It'll penetrate our hearts. It'll change us. So Holy Spirit, speak to us. Let us have ears to hear what you're speaking to us this morning. We thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody said, amen. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to John chapter 8. John chapter 8, and we will start in verse 31. John chapter 8, verse 31 says this. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, another translation says, if you abide in my word, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Do you know that the only way that the devil can work is by lying? That's the only way he can do anything is through lying. And actually, it's the only tool he has in his toolbox. He doesn't have a thousand tools. He doesn't have one called heroin addiction, one called you know, sexual sin, one called adultery, one, you know, one called alcoholism, one called depression. No, he has one tool. It's called lying. You know, later on in John chapter 8, it actually says that that's his native language. That all the devil speaks is lies. All he knows how to speak is lying. And it's, it's been his, his only tactic since day one. If you go all the way back to the book of Genesis in the Garden of Eden, you can turn there. I'm going to read from Genesis chapter 3. From the very beginning, this is what the devil's scheme has been. is just to lie. I'll start in Genesis 3, verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any fruit in the garden? No, Eve replied. We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. So notice this, right from the very beginning, the devil takes the words of God, slightly twists them, and tries to, to convince Eve of it. Because it is true that, that God said not to eat fruit, but not from every tree. He's like, did God say that you're not supposed to eat tr fruit from every tree in this garden? Look how nice all this fruit is. How could God do that? But Eve, she was smart enough. She, she knew. She's like, no, uh, sorry, that's not true. He, he said, we actually, we can eat all the fruit of the garden, just not the fruit from this one tree. And so, you know, the, the, first, uh, the first attempt that the serpent tried didn't work. Eve was too smart. So he tries round number two. Let's keep reading. The, the, the enemy or the serpent replies to her, you will not certainly die little snake tongue slithering. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. So notice how now the serpent makes God out to be the liar. Did you catch that? It says, no, you, you certainly will not die. <laughs> Did God say that to you? Oh God, he just... You know, he doesn't know what he's talking about. No, you, you will certainly not die. You know, actually, you know, if you eat of this, this fruit, then you'll be like him. And he, and he doesn't want you to be like him. 
So the, the, the enemy starts to try to, to convince Eve that maybe God's holding something good back from me. Maybe, maybe that's, you know, that's the, maybe that's the best tree in this whole, this whole garden. And, and, you know, God's holding that back from me. He doesn't want me to eat that because, you know, then I'll be like him. You know, the enemy's trying to convince Eve, maybe God is not as good as you think he is. He's trying to hold something back for, from you. And so we, we know it happens. You know, on the second try, Eve cracks. She eats the fruit. We kind of know what, what happens from there. But, you know, like I said, the only tool the devil has in his toolbox is lying. That's it. It's the only trick he can pull on us as believers. All he can do is lie to us. But did you know something? That lying only works if you don't know truth. Lying only works if you don't know the truth. I have a funny slash embarrassing slash humiliating story I want to share with you. You might think less of me after this one. Um, so maybe I shouldn't tell it. I'm just kidding. So I, when I was about 12 or 13, I was asked to be a chaperone for kids camp. Okay, so the, you know, the younger kids in the church, like the, probably like the first, I think it was like the first through fifth graders, they went to a, a summer camp at Jackson's Mill. And so me and some of my chaperone friends, I don't know why they chose us. I guess they thought we were smart. We were responsible. They, they, they you know, put us in charge of certain cabins. And uh, so there's this, this very young boy, he's probably in first or second grade, and he starts to walk up uh, to me. I'm standing outside this cabin that I'm, you know, chaperoning. And uh, he's got this piece of paper in his hand and he walks up to me and he asks me a question. He says, hey, wh what's a free buffet? I'm like, what did he say? I was, hey, sorry, bud, what, what'd you say? He said, uh, what's a free buffet? This, this paper here says free buffet. So I, I like look over his shoulder at what he's looking at and it's, it's got the Pizza Hut logo on it, okay? And I, I read it, and I realize it says free buffet, buffet. And so I realize what this thing he's holding in his hand is. So like any good, you know, kids camp chaperone would do, I said, oh, a buffet. Dude, you do not want anything to do with that buffet. Those things are no good. You don't want that thing. You know, a matter of fact, I'll take it off your hands, man, because you don't need that thing. I, I'll take it, though. Just give it to me, bud. And... Uh, I know, I'm a terrible person. But hey, I'm pretty sure I gave it back to him after I felt conviction. I was like, yo, I can't do this. I'm a bad person. I gave it back to him. Anyway, but do you think that, you know, first grade, second grade boy, if he knew what it was he was holding in his hand, do you think he would have so flippantly and easily handed it over to me? Do you think if he could read the word Buffett and know that it says buffet, not Buffett, do you think he would have said, yeah, 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 you're right, I don't want this thing? No way. Now, if he knew what that thing was, he would have shoved that down in his back pocket. And, you know, the next morning at 10.30 a.m., he'd be waiting out, outside in the, the parking lot of Pizza Hut, ready to, to you know, stuff himself full of pizza. Because, you know, if he knew what he had, there's no way he would have handed that thing over. But what happened? One simple deception, one simple lie, and he starts just handing it over. It didn't take a whole lot. I wasn't like, hey, kid, you give me that thing or you're going to get in trouble. No, I was like, eh, you don't want that thing. Oh, okay, here you go. He didn't know. He didn't know the truth, so he was easily lied to. I think, unfortunately, some Christians live this way. They don't know the truth of God's word very well, so they're, they're easily deceived. They're easily led astray. They're, they're, they're an easy target for the enemy to lie to. All he has to do is, is drop a couple simple, easy lies, and next thing you know, they're handing over their marriage. Oh, well, does he really love you? I mean, maybe he's not that great of a guy. He's never home. He's a bad husband. You know what? Go after that guy you used to like in high school. A simple lie, and people start handing over such important, valuable things in their lives. You know, I work with teenagers all the time. If you really love that guy, just sleep with him. That'll really prove that you love him. You know, teenagers handing over their virginity, their innocence, simple, simple lies from the devil. 
people handing over their families. Man, your family doesn't need you. They don't love you. Go and pursue that dream you had. You know, try this. This will make you feel good. You don't feel good? Just try this. And people get years robbed from their lives. Some of the most important things of their lives robbed, taken away from them. They didn't know truth. They were easily lied to. An easy target for the enemy. One thing I say all the time in in growth track, the more truth you know, the easier it will be for you to identify a lie. The more truth you know, it'll be easy to identify lies. But if you don't know truth, right, you're, you're an easy target. You're easily lied to. And if you're taking notes, jot this down. Word weak Christians are easily harassed Christians. If you're weak in, in the word of God, you'll be harassed all, all your life by the, by the devil. He'll just try to convince you time after time. Now, you're no good. No one loves you. No, you know, you're just going to live this way your whole life. If you're word weak, you'll be easily harassed your whole life. But the more truth you know, it'll be easy to identify a lie. I'll use this example. I, I use it sometimes. Imagine I am a huge car guy which I'm kind of a, I like my car, but I'm not like crazy. My wife would probably say otherwise. She'd probably say, yes, he is a crazy car guy. He's a car nerd. Um, But let's just say I'm like all out. I'm a crazy car fanatic. You know, I've got my maintenance, my little maintenance manual, and I'm studying that thing every day. I know like the back of my hands. I know exactly, you know, the, the compression ratio for my Jeep. I know exactly, you know, the firing order of all the pistons. I know what kind of fuel filter it takes. I know the PSI is supposed to be in my tires. Everything that you could possibly know about a car, I know about my Jeep, let's just say so, okay? And so one day I need to change my spark plugs. So I go to the auto parts store, good old advanced auto down here in Nutter Forts. I go to the, 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 the guy at the counter and I say, hey, I need some spark plugs for my Jeep. And he's like, yeah. Here you go, bud. Here's a box. You need these. Now, let's say it's the wrong box. He gives me just, they're not right at all. But if I'm someone, I've been studying my maintenance manual. I know it like the back of my hand. I know exactly what kind of spark plugs my, my engine takes. If I know the truth, then I'm not easily lied to, am I? It's like, ah, you know, sorry, dude. Uh, these are actually not the right kind of spark plugs. Um, thanks, but, but no thanks. I need those over there if you... I need, I need those for my car. But let's say, you know, the opposite is true. I know nothing about my car. All I know is I'm not supposed to put diesel in the gas tank. And, and that's about all I know about my car. And I go back to the, to the auto parts store. I was like, all right, I need some, uh, what are they called, spark plugs? I also become a hick for some reason. I don't know why. I need some, uh, some spark plugs. Is that what they call them? So, you know, the same guy throws me the same box of spark plugs. I'm like, awesome. Thank you, kind sir. These are great spark plugs. I go put them in my car, crank the engine over, and my engine blows up, right? So if I'm someone that knows truth, I can't be lied to. But if if I don't know the truth, he could hand me a, a box of fuel injectors, and I'd be like, all right, these are the greatest spark plugs ever. So it's so important for us as Christians, man, If we know the truth, like we just read, the truth will set us free from every lie of the enemy. That lies keep you bound. Truth will set you free. Lies will keep you in bondage. They'll keep you bound. But the truth of God's word will completely, completely set you free. And, you know, there's a great example of this in the life of Jesus in Matthew 4. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Matthew 4, we'll start from the very beginning of Matthew 4. Matthew 4 and verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, 
He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift up your head. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not even strike your foot against a stone. Verse 7, Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will just bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, The word, or to worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended to him. Notice how did Jesus fight lies from the enemy? With the truth of God's word, right? He didn't, he didn't fight the lies from the enemy, you know, by saying, not today, devil. No, 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 not today. He didn't you start posting on Facebook, you know, pictures of Jesus and devil in an arm wrestle. No, he fought the lies with truth. That's how it works. That's how you and me fight the lies from the enemy. You know, I was listening to uh, Pastor E.A. Adeboye. He's a, a pastor of a massive church in uh, Africa. I believe it's like, you know, like half a million people or more. I'm not exactly sure. It's a massive church. And I was listening to him preaching uh, on, just on you know, the internet a few days ago. And I'd heard something I'd never heard before. And at first I was like, oh, that, you know, I was like, is that true? But I was like, you know, I, I trust this guy. He's, he's a man of God. He, he, he knows more than I do. <laughs> so this is what he said. He said, you can call the devil whatever you want to call him. Say so he's, he's a liar. That's true. He's defeated. It's absolutely true. He's under our feet. Completely true. You can, you can list it out. That's true. You can say whatever you want, except, he said, don't call the devil a fool. I was like, what? But I thought he was a fool. You know, like, I, I was caught off guard by that. But as I was studying, just even for this morning, you know what I came across? Even in this passage we just read, notice how the devil is quoting scripture to Jesus. Did you catch that? He, he, he's quoting Psalm 91. The, you know, the Lord will send his angels to protect you. You won't even strike your foot against the stone. In Genesis 3, it says that the serpent was the most crafty of all the wild animals. That is funny. I mean, if, if the devil came to people maybe in this day and age and start quoting Psalm 91 to them, they might not even know what he's talking about. <laughs> you know, I mean, they might even know he's quoting the word of God. So it's important for us to know the truth because it's funny how people, just like the devil here, like we said before, from Genesis 3 even until here, he'll take the word of God, twist it, take, maybe take it out of context, and then deceive people. Maybe you, you've met someone like that. Or maybe, I mean, I'll be honest, it, it happens a lot. People, they'll, they'll find a piece of scripture and they'll kind of make it justify the way they're living. Well, I mean, the Bible says da 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 I mean... You know, take something out of context to make it fit to, to their lifestyle so that, you know, this is okay for me. And it's, it's deception. It's a lie from the enemy to get people to think that, you know, they're, 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 living, they're living the way they're supposed to be living and they're, they're really not. So Jesus fought the lies with truth. And notice how, you know, when Jesus is in the middle of being tempted, he's being lied to. Notice he didn't say, uh, hold on a second, uh, devil, uh, give me a moment. He pull out his pocket Old Testament. Uh, I know this is in here somewhere. Just give me a second. No, he didn't have time to, to skim through the whole Old Testament trying to find what passages to speak. What, what, what was, he had the word of God hidden in his heart, amen? The word of God the, in the book of Psalms, it says, I will hide your word in my heart so that I might not sin against God. The more word you have hidden in your heart, the more powerful you'll be as a Christian. Hide God's word in your heart. Not just, you know, I, I can quote John 3, 16. <laughs> no, have the word of God hidden deep inside your heart. So in, when those moments may come, temptation, lying may come, you're not, easily, you're not easily led astray. You're not easily deceived. No, you know what? The word of God says to worship the Lord and to worship him only. You know, the word of God says, you know, that I've not been given a spirit of fear. Whatever it may be, have God's word hidden in your heart, just like Jesus did in this story. You know, the Bible says in, in Hosea 4, 6, you know what it says? It says, 
My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. Did you catch that? Wherever there's lack of knowledge about the truth of God's word, things will get destroyed. People will get destroyed. And that's not just an Old Testament random verse we pulled out. It's, it's in the New Testament. Check this out. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 10. It's talking about people that will be deceived in the end times. It says this. It says, they perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. They refuse to love the truth. And it goes beyond just, I have a Bible in my basement. No, loving the truth. Like we said, you know, meditating on it day and night, delighting ourselves in the word of God, loving truth. Where there's a lack of knowledge, there's destruction. Let's go back to John chapter 8. If you kept your finger there, we'll, we'll jump back there and read that passage again where we started. John chapter 8. Let's read verse 31 and 32 again. It said, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. I think many times people can read verse 32 without reading verse 31, which is important for verse 32. Because I want, I'll read that again. Notice how it's an if-then statement. Catch this. If you hold to my teachings, another translation says, abide in my word. If you abide in my word, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. How, how do we know truth? How can we be people that, that we love truth? If you abide in my word. It's so important to be people that, that, that hold on to the word of God that cling to the word of God, that depend on the word of God, abiding in it, day, you know, meditating on it, day in and day out, hiding God's word in our hearts. Then you'll know truth and the truth will set you free. Being people that, that meditate on his word, that delight ourselves in God's word. So how do we know truth? We hold on to God's, God's teaching. You know, be, be stubborn about the word of God. Be stubborn about the word of God. This is what I mean. You ever heard someone say, just, just let it go. Just, maybe you're upset about something or, hey, just let it, just let it go. No, we're, we're told to hold to the teachings of God's word. You know, you know, maybe the doctor said this about me. No, I hold to the word of God that says that, that he keeps sickness and disease far from us, that he's God, our healer. Maybe, you know, someone would say to you, I mean, you're, you're you're worthless, you're, you're no good, no one loves you. No, I cling to the word of God that says that, that the, the Lord loves me so much that he sent his one and only son to die for me. Cling, hold to the word of God. Be stubborn about the word of God. Use the word of God. The, you know, the word of God is useful. We talked about that last, last time we did this series. Use the word of God, do the word of God. Be doers. You know, that's what a disciple is. A disciple is someone that does what the teacher tells them to do. That's what a disciple is. James 1.22, you might know, it says, don't just be hearers of the word of God. And so what? Deceive yourselves. Be doers of the word of God. You can hear the word of God all day long and actually still be deceived until you begin to do the word of God. I heard someone once say, you know, a, bottle, a bottle of medicine is great, but it can't do you a bit of good until you take it. And we can have... The, the, the book of truth, everything we need to know is in this book. You know, life itself is in this book. Everything we need. It doesn't do you a whole lot of good until you open it, right? <laughs> Be doers of the word of God. Cling to the word of God. Abide in the word of God. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Let's keep reading in, in, in John chapter 8. We'll jump down to verse 33. We'll keep reading. It says, They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham. And have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, anyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you are free indeed. 
Maybe you would say something similar this morning as those Jews said. We're, we're, we're sons of Abraham. What do I need set free from? I, I'm no slave. They say, man, I live in America. I'm free. What are you talking about? And hey, uh, this is not for everyone. By, by no means is this for everyone. But I do think that people are starting to become okay with being in bondage. People are starting to be okay with being a slave. And maybe they don't even know it. But it's deception. You know, I heard someone say once, the worst thing about deception is that you're deceived. You're deceived. You know, maybe, maybe you've heard someone say something like this. If you're, if you're completely honest, maybe you've said something like this. Well, I mean, if you knew my life and what I've gone through, you'd understand that it's, it's okay for me. I'm, I mean, I know the Bible says, you know, you're not supposed to do that, but come on. It's the 21st century. Can anyone live up to that standard? Come on. It's not a big deal for me. It's just, it's my struggle. I mean, everyone's got their struggle. This is just my struggle. Hey, I'm a guy. Guys just struggle with lust. Guys just struggle with pornography. It's, it's just kind of my thing. No, you're deceived. You, the Bible says, Jesus says, you, you're a slave. What, what does it say? Anyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. It doesn't say anyone who practices sin is a practicer of sin. No, they are a slave to sin. I'm not saying this to be heavy handed. I'm saying this because you can be set free. Why be bound if you could be set free? People are okay with staying, staying in bondage, staying full of shame, full of regret. Why, why live in bondage if you could just be set free? You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. What if that person understood the truth in Romans 6, the Bible says, the power of sin has been broken, that, I, that sin's no longer my master, that Jesus is my master, that I don't have to do what my sinful nature always tells me to do. I can live free. What if they understood? The Bible says that I, if I'm a Christian, I've been made righteous, that I, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I don't have to com, continue to live a, a sinful, dirty, filthy life. I'm made righteous in God's sight. I can live righteously, that I, I'm no longer a dirty, filthy sinner that he's taken off my filthy garments and put garments of white on me, pure robes on me. If you, if you began to get the truth of God's word planted in your, your spirit, I, I truly believe, man, you will be completely set free from whatever that thing is. Or maybe you would say, hey, you know, for me, it's a, uh, well, I mean, I, I'm just someone that's always struggled with, with fear or anxiety or depression. It's, you know, it's just, I've learned to live with it. It's, it's not a big deal, for, you know. I know that sometimes it's hard, but I just make it through. Don't be deceived. Do you know what the Bible says? What, what if they understood the truth of God's word and realized, uh, you know, the Bible says that I've not been given a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. What if they understood you? In Psalm 23, it says that I can walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the, the, the darkest parts of life, and I don't have to fear. Why? Because God's right next to me. You don't have to live bound by fear. You don't have to live bound by depression. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. He gives, he gives the oil of, of gladness for the people that are mourning, that you can live completely free from all of that. Sometimes the worst is a spirit of religion. Hello. Sometimes that can be the worst. It, it doesn't become about Jesus and the love we have for God. It becomes about, well, this rule and that rule, and this is how the church should do it. And you can be set free from that this morning. You will know the truth and the truth will set you completely, completely free. Whoever the sun sets free, they're free indeed. You know, why come up with 50 reasons why you should be bound to that sin when you could just allow the word of God to, to penetrate your hearts and be free? Why come up with 50 reasons why it's okay for me to live this way? You know, it, don't make a big deal about it. It's just, I have anxiety attacks sometimes. I have, I have depression sometimes. Why come up with 50 reasons why you should still live that way if God can come and set you free today? 
Be free. Live in total, complete freedom. You, you won't find freedom anywhere else. You can't get yourself free. That's the opposite of the gospel, isn't it? I can't, I can't get myself free. I can work and try all I want. Uh, I got it under control. I, I know I'm struggling, but I can, I can do it. I can. No, you can't. You'll spend another decade still stuck in that sin. You can't get yourself free from it. You want to, you want to get out from underneath, but you can't. Why? Lies keep you bound. Truth will set you completely free. Let the truth of God's word set you completely free today, amen.